which now I could put in over here. It's preserved primarily in the Vercelli manuscript in Vercelli, Italy. That is one of those four major poetic codices. The poem itself dates from the late 7th to sometime in the 8th century. We know the Riccioli manuscript is 10th century. Part of it is preserved, or some lines of it are preserved, in this, what is now a cross, in Dumfries, Scotland. And the cross is spelled Ruthwell. It's pronounced Ribble, like dribble without the D. Okay? Um, stands 18 feet tall, and this thing, it's been fairly securely dated early 8th century, okay, so 700 to maybe 725, and that's what I've got pulled up here, and I've got it pulled up to this part of the cross first um, to talk about this for a moment. In the late 17th century, the, what's called the cross, was thrown down and broken up. Okay? Scotland passed an act against religious idolatry and such. Okay? So stone crosses were destroyed. I mean, think about this, wrap your head around this, you know. Because you love Jesus so much, you're destroying things that, you know, reflect um, what his whole kind of purpose for human existence was. Anyways, what we have now stands 18 feet tall. We know that that's not the original height. It was originally taller than that because there were pieces missing when it was reconstructed in the 19th century. Okay? So when it was reconstructed in the 19th century, parts that were missing were just supplied with other pieces of stone. And one of the things I was just reading, this is from Wikipedia, one of the things I was just reading um, is the suggestion that it may not have originally been a cross at all. It might just have been a pillar. This whole section is new. This is 19th century. Okay? This part is original, and that part is original. But what was originally between those, okay, when this was made in the 19th century, was assumed to be cross arms, all right? Why? Well, the poem, partially of which, not many lines, just two or three, that are inscribed on here is about the cross of Christ. So if you're inscribing these lines on here, um, you would kind of think that that means that they were inscribed on a cross. Let me shrink this down some now so you can see the entirety of this, for example, this is modern. So you've got there almost the whole thing. This down here is modern. So you've got engravings, carvings, and I'm going to go back for a second, that if you go to just the Wikipedia site, it tells you what is in each of the sides, each of the images. So there's Christ, um, the washing of Christ's feet on the south side. There are other parts. And then here is, you know, a representation and kind of drawing of the root, the um, inscription in runes. And it's inscribed in runes on all four faces, partially. Not all of that is the dream of the rude um, poem. So you've got Paul and Anthony on one side, Christ is judged with two animals, um, vine scrolls, which is called interlaced feature, which we'll talk about a little bit. This is what it looked like when it was outside. Now it's in, they built a separate chapel um, for it to be housed in. Okay, and again, this thing's roughly 1,300 years old. And for most of that 1,300 years, it sat outside broken up in the rain and in the elements. Well, we all know rain, snow, cold, ice tend to break stone apart. So some of what's there isn't necessarily that clear. And there have been a lot of studies done in the last 15, 20 years on this, including people coming in with laser scanners and scanning the whole face 
to try to make out parts that um, are not necessarily clear to the naked eye. There's one other site, in case you're interested, if you do, just do a simple Google search, you know, Wikipedia comes up first, and if you go to this one, Gettysburg College of All Flakes, and I think I know who did this. I think it's a guy named Al Bruce, Alexander Bruce, uh, who's a Dream of the Root scholar, who we actually interviewed for a job here several years ago, and in the English department's uh, unwisdom, we turned them down. It would have been really good. But this has, I tried to get that to work earlier. Yep, it doesn't work. The images do work. So you've got images of all the sides that allow you to see them fairly closely and so that you can see the runes up and down um, either side. Okay, and I can turn that off now. I just wanted to pull that up and show it to you. Pull it off. <clears throat> so it's the dream of the rune. What's rune? Obviously, no. Nope. It's a cross, okay? Rune equals the cross, okay? The dream of the rune. Is it the cross dreaming? No, it is a person's dream of the cross of Christ. But in this dream, the cross speaks. The cross um, would be what kind of thing? Animate, inanimate. Inanimate. It's inanimate. So when you have an inanimate, Thing speak, you have an example of prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia. There are two or three prosopopoeic poems in Old English. This is one of them. Um, and then there are these two, they're not really riddles. One's kind of a charm. These two fragmentary poems called. Um, the husband's message, and I can't remember the other one. The husband's message is this little, very short poem inscribed, according to the poem, on a piece of wood. And the piece of wood is speaking it, okay? In the cross of Christ, the cross is speaking, okay, in much of this dream. There is another example. Um, of this somewhat in, and I keep meaning to put all this stuff up on Facebook, and maybe I will, or not on Facebook, on the um, class page. The Frank's Casket, oh, which I don't have the projector up for you. Uh, the Frank's Casket is this box made of whalebone, okay? Currently in the British Museum, except for one piece, the lid. The lid's in France. And it's inscribed on all four sides. Okay? It's got runes on all four sides. And it has mythological imagery on all four sides, or mythological stories. They're called mythological. They aren't all mythological. One of them, for example, is the fall of Jerusalem by Titus, the Roman commander, in 70 AD. That's not mythological. That's historical. The birth of Christ is another one. But then you also have Germanic myth portrayed in there, okay? Um, as well as a couple of Romulus and Remus being suckled by the wolf is in there. So it's kind of thought that, you know, on this whale bone casket, it's called a casket just because it's a little box, um, it's kind of thought that these are kind of major foundational myths, major national myths of various groups. So you've got the Romans, you've got the Jews, you've got the Germanic peoples, um, etc. But in the runic inscription, it's kind of a riddle. And the riddle is blah, 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 what am I? And it's, you know, whalebone, okay? So with the dream of the rune, the cross of Christ is speaking. Who is it speaking to? The dreamer. But what's it speaking about? What would the cross of Christ 
have to tell someone who is dreaming? Well, let's look. Listen. The first word in the poem is not listen. The first word in the poem, as we will see also in the Old English Beowulf, is what? What? Modern English, the H and the W transpose. What? Why in the world begin a sentence, begin a poem with what? It's not a question. Right? It's an interjection. It's, it's a loud single note. Okay? Single, not single sound per se, but single word meant to do one thing. Grab your attention. Grab your attention. That's it. It is the proverbial someone standing up in a crowded party with a crystal glass and a piece of flatware going and getting everybody's attention. Or, hey! Uh, there are various translations, you know, some late 19th century translations, you get, lo! There's even a 20th century translation about this and Beowulf that begin with, yo! Which completely blows kind of the atmosphere of the poem. Yo, dudes! Excuse yo, dude, me, is that like an A-E? A-E, yes. It's called an ash. A E digraph. Okay? It's the sound in a ah. cat, fat, sat, mat, etc. Okay? So what? Listen. I will speak of the sweetest dream, what came to me in the middle of the night, when speech bearers slept in their rest. It seemed to me that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, wound round with light. The brightest of beams, all that beacon was covered in gold. Jim stood fair at the earth corners, and there were five up on the cross beam. I wasn't going to do this, but I've decided to. It's a bit longer than Wandering Seafair, so hopefully I won't um, get too off track. Let's cut the lighting a little bit. That'll work. I think that's big enough. So there's the what at the top. It's Swevnikis Sejinwila, what may you matter? What dreamed to me? Okay. Notice your translation. I will speak of the sweetest dream, what came to me. Okay. What itch swemnikist, I, uh, sorry, I did the anatomy one. What I, of the uh, best of dreams, to say, will, or desire, what happened to me. Okay. In the middle of the night. So midrenichte, that's pretty clear. When speech bearers slept in their rest. Speech bearers. It's the word right here. That is a literal translation of that. Rared, that's speech. Barrened, bearing. Okay. What is a speech bearer? A herald. Kind of. A herald can be a class of these things. Subjects. That would be a class of these things. See, here's the problem with this kind of translation. It's not apparent what is meant. Okay? A speech bearer is an example of a kinney. Metaphor of a metaphor. Okay. 
Are birds speech bearers? Are dogs speech bearers? No. Men and women. What people, that's what speech bearers are. So why not just call it when men slept in their rest? Because speech bearer sounds better. Well, speech bearer gives that idea of the kidding. Or how about when those who bear speech, because speech bearers, three syllables, those who bear speech, four syllables, those who communicate with language, that's like ten syllables. Notice how nice and compact Old English is. Even when it uses something like a kidding, to get across its point. Because a native Anglo-Saxon would have heard rare barren and known immediately what it is. Even though they would also have known, this is a kidding. This is an image. It's not telling you directly exactly what the thing is. Okay? So, it seemed that I saw. Okay? It seemed. Thuchta me thought itch saw. Notice it's not. Itch. Itch. I. This is me. Me. Okay? Your gloss. It seemed that I saw. Thuchta me thought itch you saw. Thought I that I saw. It's not thought I. The thought does what? Okay. May, it's object. It's objective form, or mech. It's the objective form. What does that mean? The thought comes from where? Outside. The thought comes to me. He doesn't say, it seemed to me, the translation doesn't, that the seeming comes from outside. Notice the action here. The speaker is suggesting, where do thoughts come from? They don't come from in here. They come from out there. So, the thought came to me that I, then we get the subject, that I saw what? A most wondrous tree. Raised on high, on, some of you have driven with them before, on Luft Laden. What is Luft? They're not the people who drive you. You could have put Uber, but Uber doesn't work right, quite right, because what does Luft imply? Not the modern English driver. What was the German Air Force called in World War II? The Luftwaffe. You can take a German airline today called Lufthansa. What's Luft? It's in the air. Okay? It's lifted up. Okay? I saw this thing led on lift, led up in the air, okay? So he sees this cross raised up high, wound round with light, the brightest of beams, Beama Bertost, with beams, brightest. All that beacon was covered in gold. Look at that. All that beacon was Go all King Jamesy, begotten with gold. Okay. So covered with gold, gold plated. Yeah, it's not solid gold. Okay, it's covered with gold. Gems stood. Gemas. It's not or yemas. It's not a hard G. It's a soft G. Yeah. Yemas stoden fair at Foden, uh, Foden Shatum, at the earth's corners. And there were five on the cross beam. The cross beam. We have this word in modern English. Take the E off, and it's an axle. Okay. These were the axle spana, your shoulders because they're the axle of your body, okay? So, 
It's got gems. Why are there gems on the outstretched arms of the cross? And what are the gems? Are we talking like sapphire and topaz and diamond and stuff? Blood. Blood. Okay. There were five upon the cross beam. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows, but holy spirits beheld him there. Men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Okay. Beholden there. Sorry. Beholden there, angel drifteth all. Okay, that's plural. This is the angel. Hmm. Who's doing the beholding? The angels? Because that angle is singular. This is plural. This is a problem in the poem. We're not quite sure what it means. If it's plural, um, it's they beheld there. What? The angel of the Lord. Is this the subject? All. Everyone beheld there. And the angel of the Lord is therefore Christ. Because in many biblical commentaries, when you refer to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, usually in a modern Bible where the angel is capitalized, that is a prefiguring of Christ coming and talking to the Old Testament Jews and such. It was not, what, a gallows right, of a felon, but Holy Spirits, but all there beheld him, Hallelujah, Holy Spirits, men over the earth, and all this glorious creation. So everything, the whole universe, beheld Christ hanging there on the cross. All right? Wondrous was the victory tree. And I stained by sins. Notice the juxtaposition. The tree is glorious. The cross is glorious. And I, the speaker, what? Not so much. Wounded with guilt. Wondrous was the tree. And I, uh, it shone. Where is the wounded with guilt? I, for wounded mid womb woes. Saw I the tree of glory. Glad am you aware that uh, dressed in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. Why the creator's tree? Is it because God made it? Who is Christ? According to Christ traditional Christian theology. The Son of God. And? The Son of Man. And? The Son of Man. Both true? Messiah, three, Trinity. Christ wasn't the Trinity. He wasn't God the Father. He was God the Son. He wasn't God the Spirit. He was God the Son. But, again, according to traditional theology, it's through Christ that everything is made. He's the creator. Okay? St. Paul talks about that in what, Colossians. So, Speaker goes on, and yet beneath that gold I began to see an ancient wretched struggle. Beneath that gold, is it like the gold starts to peel and he sees what's underneath it? Or the plating, it's plating you can see around it. Okay, is it that? Or is it kind of like every now and then you, know, you go somewhere and they hand you a thing and it's got the little like hologram thing and you turn it? And what do you see? Two different images. Depends on how you look at it. Is he looking at the cross, and at one point, he sees the cross, and it's covered in gold and gems. And at another point, he sees, it first began to bleed on the right side. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. So the cross has got blood streaming down the right side, and that's a fair vision? I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. So does the cross kind of lean down, pick up a different set of clothing, 
You put it on? No, not literally. Metaphorically, the cross is standing there, and it does what? It shimmers from one form to another. In one form, blood and sweat and gore streaming down it. In the other, covered in gold and gemstones. Or maybe it's just all in the eye of the beholder. And what the beholder sees is that really the blood and sweat are gemstones or of ultimate value. Maybe it's a kind of a transformation going on in the mind of the beholder. And yet, lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree until I heard it utter a sound. The best of words began to speak words. Notice, he's lying on the ground. How is he not lying? How can he not be prostrate? can't be lying on his stomach. Why? Because he couldn't look up and see the sky that way. He's lying on his back, and when he sees the cross raised up, it's implied because he sees the cross beam, and he sees the gems standing fair at the earth's corners. What are the earth's corners? We all know the world is round. Guess what? Bede talks about the world being like a ball. B, who died in 735. Not a circle. A ball. A sphere. The ancients knew the world was round, in other words. Okay? So when he talks about the Earth's four corners, what are the four corners of the world? Label them. Oh, the compass is North, south, east, west. So when he sees... The gem standing at the four corners, he's lying there, and what does he see? He looks all the way back, and that's where the upper point of the cross is touching the horizon. He looks towards his feet. The base of the cross is touching the horizon. He looks either point of the cross's arms, and the arms are touching the horizon. This is a big cross. <laughs> Right? It stretches horizon to horizon, horizon to horizon. Why? It encompasses the world. Literally encompasses. Okay? And it speaks out of this giant cross, variously looking to be covered with gold and gems, and then have blood streaming down its side. The cross says, it was so long ago. I mean, this is like 700 years ago, right? It was so long ago, I remember it still, that I was felled from the forest's edge. So this isn't Jesus speaking through the cross. It's not Christ. It's not some angel. This is the wood of the actual tree saying, I remember when I was a little tree. When some men came and cut me down, ripped up from my roots, strong enemies seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. Okay? Took me there, strange. What word does that look like? Fiends. A fiend is what? A villain. An enemy, a villain. Okay? And what did they do? These fiends, these enemies, seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders, the fiends, and did what? Set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. Then I saw, and we start to get, I'm going to do it over here. We start to get this juxtaposition. The Lord of Mankind. Okay? Do what? Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. Lord of mankind. Who is that? God. Okay? But it's Christ. So it's the God man that was referred to earlier. How does he come? Eagerly. Eagerly. 
Notice, is he being dragged, kicking and screaming? No, I don't want to die. Is he, oh, yes, take me, just slaughter me for the blood of the people. I'll just save them all. No. How's he coming? Let's do this. All right, let's roll. 9-11 little shout out there. He wanted to ascend upon me. That is, climb up, not to be raised. He wanted to raise himself up on me. So, the cross says, I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. What's he talking about, seeing the ends of the earth tremble? Wasn't it the collapse of the temple? Wasn't it the collapse of the temple? But when Christ, according to the Gospels, gave up his spirit, what happened? Earthquake. The graves were opened, the dead walked out, etc., etc. Right? Who's in here right over there? Oh, that's right. Remember the other day I put up over here the fourfold Germanic ethic? Duty to Lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin, trust and reliance and weird. And we talked about the Lord Thane relationship, right? What is the Lord's duty to his Thanes? Distribute treasure. What are the Thanes' duties to their Lord? Fight for him. What else is part of the Lord's duty? Well, that's also to fight and defend your people, not the Thanes. The Lord goes off into battle, often with his saints, to defend whom? Those who are left behind. Generally, the weak, the infirm, not being sexist, women, children. Germanic women did not go off into battle. In fact, in a very famous account written by Tacitus the Roman in about 100 AD, he wrote a book called Germania. His father was essentially an ambassador to the Germanic tribes. And Tacitus describes the Germans when they would get ready to go into battle. And he describes their women, daughters, wives, etc., you know, in this one particular battle, standing up on a hillside as their husbands, sons, brothers, uncles, etc., are getting ready to go off into battle, and they rip their clothes off and say, this is what you're fighting for. Whoa, that's pretty graphic. Because what does that mean? You lose? Not only do you lose this, but what more importantly than that? What happens to the women? They get raped. They become enslaved. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, speaker goes on. He says, I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. Why? Because the good thing obeys his king. The cross is saying, I was a fiend of my Germanic Lord. He didn't break his word. He didn't go against his will. Even though he wanted to. Easily I might have fell of all those enemies. Okay, just pause here for a minute. How could the cross have felled all those enemies. Who are all the enemies, first of all? The people who destroyed them. The centurions, the Roman soldiers, and you could go all metaphorical and say, you know, and everybody else. <laughs> so how is the cross going to do this? Is, is he going to fall on them? Is he going to go all, you know, think the one Star Wars movie, all um, Count What's-His-Name and Yoda do the, yeah, Count Dooku and... I mean, is he going to do all this jujitsu on him? More easily would have borne them on the cross. Yeah, but he says I could have felled them all. Kind of interesting, anyways. I think so. Yet fast I stood. Fast means firm. Why? It's true. Because then. Placing this, the young hero made ready. So we have the Lord of mankind, and then later on we had Lord again, and now we get this again. 
The Young Hero. So, The Young Hero, line 39. Then the young hero made ready. That was God Almighty. On Girida heeneth a young haleth. That was God Almighty. The young hero, God Almighty. What's the difference between those two? There is a bit of difference. Young hero means what? Inexperienced. Does it mean inexperienced? Or youthful. Youthful. This is human. This is divine. Christ is what? According to traditional Christian, Christian theology. The oh. God-man. Okay? Human, divine, one person. God, Jesus, in, or God, Jesus, son of Mary, in the flesh. So we're going to see several lines where the poet emphasizes this again and again and again. He's going to emphasize his human nature and his divine nature. In the single person. So, that was God Almighty, strong and resolute, like you would expect whom to be a good Germanic hero. You can't be a good Germanic hero and head off into battle like um, Peter Jackson's version of, El of uh, Aragorn. Aragorn. Because Peter Jackson doesn't understand Tolkien, and it's an ass, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> Aragorn is what? He's kind of a dramatic hero. He doesn't go off in the battle going, oh, I don't know, can I really be the king? I ought to be. Will I ever really have Arwen's love? Oh, boo-hoo. No. You go in resolute. What does that mean? Your mind is made up. Okay. I doubt, maybe I'm wrong, that those 243, 245, whatever the number was, firefighters who ran towards the Twin Towers 17 years ago, I doubt if many of them were not resolute. Why? They would not have armor. You wouldn't run to that kind of danger if you weren't sure of what you were doing. In fact, some of the firefighters, even today, they got cancer because of... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of them did. Yeah. So... He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. What kind of language is that? Is that poetry? I mean, yes, it is poetry. But what is the speaker doing? He's using poetry to what end? This is teaching. Okay. What kind of teaching? This is doctrine. The speaker is teaching Doctrine. Why did Christ rise on the cross? To ransom mankind. What does ransom mean? Forgiveness of our sins. Okay. Buy off. Yeah. It literally means to buy off. Well, who's the ransom paid to? God? Satan? It's not said. I trembled when he embraced me. Notice the depiction of Christ here is not like in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, where Christ is nailed with his back. To the cross. Why? Because it's hard to embrace somebody with your back. Try it sometime. Go up to your boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, and try and put your arms around them this way. Unless you're double jointed, it ain't gonna happen. You gotta do what? Because what can you do this way? You can get all wrapped around them. This is what Christ does with the cross. Why? This is what he is made for. This is his purpose. I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. Notice, by mentioning the possibility of bowing to the ground, what is the cross telling us entered its mind? Assuming a dead tree has a mind, 
at that point. I wanted to. I thought about it. But I dared not. Why? That's his Lord. That's his Lord. This is his Lord's purpose. And that would be going against the will of his Lord. Or fall to the earth corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. Reared there has two meanings. We use one of them today. We don't use the other one very much. What's one of the meanings for reared as in today? Raised for a purpose. Raised for a purpose. Okay. What's the other one? Child rearing. When you Raise a child up. He is saying two things. One, from my youth. From a little set. Think of, you know, if you're familiar with the Marvel Universe, little Groot, when he gets blown up, and we get the little teeny tiny Groot League, and it grows up into a bigger group. That's what he means. From my first falling, as, I don't know what kind of tree it was. Let's say it's an oak. As an acorn. This is what I was supposed to be. How do we know? Because the Lord of mankind, the creator of the universe, <laughs> was going to hang on me. And he planned it all. What else? Those dirty, rotten, nasty Romans, they raised me up as this. If you take both those meanings together, what does that imply? God's doing the raising of the tree, the planting of the tree, the whole nine yards there. And then you have the Romans doing their little bit. Do the Romans know that they're working nope. hand in glove <laughs> with God's purpose? Nope. Go back to the Old Testament. You frequently see, you know, when the Jews fall away and stuff, God says, you know, I'm having to do this to you. Why? To bring you back. And so what does he do? You have Pharaoh raised up. For what purpose? serve God's will. Does Pharaoh know he's serving God's will? Not a clue. Okay. So, I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. Cross. I raised up the mighty king not kind king lord of heaven. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Notice kind of, you know, skipping what? <laughs> Christ first. I mean, the nails didn't come through the cross into Christ. They came through Christ into the cross. The scars are still visible. There's still nail holes, the cross is saying, on my outstretched arms and on my foot, the bottom of the cross. Open wounds of hate. I dared not harm any of them. How many times has he said, one, I dare not harm any of them, or I dare not fall down? We're getting close to like a half dozen. Emphasizing, I really wanted to, but duty to obey one's Lord. They mocked us both together. I don't know about that. Go back and read the Gospels. They don't say anything about, ha, you stupid cross. Come on, if you're really the cross, let's see you do something about it. Come on, you big, mighty oak, you. No, it's, if you're really the Christ, what? Come down off there. If you're really the Christ, do what? If the cross is a thing, therefore insulting his Lord is also insulting him. True. And that's what he means. Okay. They mocked us both together. I was all drenched with blood. Yeah, but not its own blood. It's Christ's blood. Flowing from that man's, because God, who is spirit, doesn't bleed. From that man's side, after he had sent forth his spirit, sends it out there. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. The cross goes on. I saw the... God of hosts. What does the of hosts refer to? Gifts. It's not gifts. It's 
kind of. It's the angelic army. So it's all the angelic beings from the very, very lowest of the lowest of angels all the way to the highest of the cherubim and seraphim. Countless numbers. I saw the Lord of that cruelly stretched out. How do you stretch out God? I mean, it's not like bread dough that, you know, you get a rolling pin and stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. Stretched out like this. Why? Because blood fell from that man's side. Darkness had covered with its clouds. The rulers... Corpse. So you have in that half line the distinction. Because what line is that? 54. The Waldendas, wielders, raw, raw, it's corpse or body, okay? That shining radiance. How shining would, is he talking about, you know, Christ's body there is like Moses when he comes down from Sinai and his face is illuminated from within? It's not like Moses is walking around and he's got a selfie stick with a spotlight. You know, look, look at me. It's the light is coming from within and shining out. Is, is Christ's body doing that? And where there are the holes, even more light shining out? No. All right. Where'd you go? Shadows spread gray under the clouds. What happened at the crucifixion? There was darkness for three hours from when he was crucified until his death. All creation wept, and we are at the symbolic or metaphorical center of the poem, even though it's not the literal center of the poem. All creation wept, mourned the king's fall. Why? Christ was on Roda. Christ was on the cross. Christ was on Roda, line 56. Okay? And yet from afar, men came hastening to that noble one. That noble one would be back over on this side. I watched it all. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. Who are those who came from afar? The apostles. The apostles. They came to take Christ's body down, right? They take it. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus go to Pilate. Pilate says, yes, you can take the body down. They come, they take the body down. They lay it in a new tomb, a tomb that nobody has been laid in before. Traditional burial practices in um, this period Jewish culture, you bury a body in a tomb, you wait till all the flesh rots away after many years, and then you go back into the tomb, you take the bones, and you put them in a little burial box. Sometimes the box is made out of wood, often it's made out of stone. The burial box was not discovered, it was brought to public light in the last five years, that had on it an inscription that essentially said, James, brother of Jesus. Well, according to the Gospels, Jesus had a brother named James. And so there is all kinds of talk about, it. is this the real? The only problem is both James and Yeshua were pretty common names at the time, okay? Anyways, so he says, I watched all this. The cross was lowered. I sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. There they took. We get Almighty God again. Lifted, his, lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me standing drenched in blood. That is, they took Christ off, and then they put the cross back in its hole. Why do I say back in its hole? Because it was hammered down into a 
It wasn't hammered. The traditional way for the, the Romans to put crosses in the ground is while the cross is laying flat on the ground, you bring the fella, the person being executed, to it. You nail them, you nail that person to the cross while it's lying flat. Then you get a bunch of people and you lift it up and you put the bottom of the cross in a hole. And that hole is right near where that cross is situated. And the hole is because the person, you know, five foot, six feet tall, and the cross is designed to really hold them up high so that, like, if the cross were in here, Christ's head would be like at the ceiling because you want everybody to see it. This is a warning. This is like in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, putting someone's head on a pike on the city gates. It's don't do what this person did, right? So the cross is pretty tall. It's not just like, you know, seven feet. It's 10 or 12, 14 feet tall, which means it's also pretty big in diameter, like a telephone pole almost. So it takes several people to lift that, plus you got a person on it. So you lift it up, and if the hole, because of how high, high it is, the hole's got to be fairly deep in order to keep it upright. So if you are got a 10-foot pole, that 10 feet needs to stay above the ground. Your hole that it's got to slide into is going to be minimum three feet in order to keep it upright. Okay? So imagine now, you're lifting that like this. This is the base. What does it do once it gets up high enough so that the full bottom clears both sides of the hole? Boom! You're nailed to that thing like this. You're not standing on something. So your body just drops three feet. And you're nailed here and here, or in some instances, here and here. What happens? Your shoulders immediately dislocate. Okay? And your flesh rips. Because your shoulders immediately dislocate, what can you no longer do easily? Louder? Hold yourself up. Hold yourself up. Breathe. Breathe. You're going. <laughs> That's why you die. You die from asphyxiation. You don't die from loss of blood or the pain, which can be extreme. <laughs> That's why every year, my opinion, there are crazies in the Philippines. <laughs> At Easter, they crucify themselves, or they have other, because it's kind of hard to crucify yourself. They have others crucify them, reenacting. Here's what they don't do. They don't drop the pole in the ground. Because if you do that, you dislocate, and then, which is why it doesn't, you know, it's why Pilate, you know, the, the Jews asked Pilate, would Go break their legs. Why? It's Passover. We can't have them hanging on the crosses, etc., etc. Because if he doesn't break their legs, what's going on? They're hanging there for days. This is why crucifixion was the most horrid form of execution. You could live for days, for a week, for longer than a week. All while in extreme agony. Okay? So, they took him down. They raised me back up. They laid him down, bone weary, and stood by his body's head. They watched the Lord of heaven there. So notice, they took him down. They watched his body, the Lord of of heaven again he's just juxtaposing earthly divine or human divine again and again and again body with kind of spiritual aspect and we're told they watched the Lord of heaven there who rested a while weary from his mighty battle is this you know um, what's the author's name Dan Brown. Dan Brown, you know, the Da Vinci Code and everything, 
Jesus wasn't really dead. He was uh, Princess Bradish mostly dead. He just needed a miracle max to give him a pill and he was bright as day. This is an example of that word I used the other day, Leitertes. How weary of battle was he? Dead, dead. Okay? He was entirely dead. So what happens? They build the tomb for him in the side of his slayer. The cross is telling us where I was raised as a cross, I can see where he was buried. carved it from bright stone. They sat within the Lord of Victories. Think of the irony of that. The Lord of Victories. Usually if you're victorious, what happens at the end of a battle? You stay alive. You leave. <laughs> well, I mean, because you have to be alive in order to leave. But he's getting buried. So how is he Lord of Victories? Is it merely meant as irony? Or as paradox? I think it might be meant as paradox, which is quite a bit different from irony. But what else? Traditional Christian doctrine, what is the crucifixion? He resurrects three days later, right? That's his victory. It's on the cross that Christ is victorious. It's not the resurrection. It's the cross itself. Christ says just before the, the crucifixion, Father, glorify me. And God says, thou art glorified. When is Christ really glorified? When he's hanging there dead on the cross. That's his glory. Okay? So, they sing a dirge for him. Why? Because they're good Germanic apostles. And in good Germanic fashion, if your Lord dies and you happen to outlive him, then you march around his grave and sing a funeral song for him. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. We see the exact same thing. All right? We see it when Boromir dies. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli do this. We see it when um, Aragorn, Legolas, when Aragorn and, and um, Gandalf and the others are making their way to um, Theoden's Hall. They, they come by these new burials, and Aragorn sings this song. And in the Lord of the Rings, the song that he sings is in Old English. The song is supposed to be the language of Rowan, which this is one of the things Peter Jackson actually did right in the film. It's one of the very, very few things he did right in the film. So they sing the song, and we're told they wish to travel hence, weary from the glorious Lord, and he rested there with little company. How little company? Utterly alone. Bingo. Goose egg. By himself. All right? And as we stood... Who's the we? The apostles on the cross? No, nope, because the apostles left. The cross and the two other guys? Bingo. The cross and the two other crosses. Okay? As we stood there, weeping a long while, fixed in our station, the crosses, the song ascended from those warriors, and the corpse grew cold. Yeah, the corpse. The Lord of heaven, almighty God, the ruler, the God of hosts, etc., etc. Then they began to fell us all to the earth. They dug for us a deep pit, but the Lord's saints, friends, found me there. And we have a collapsing of time. Okay? Then they buried us in a pit. They who? Not the Lord's saints that comes in the next half-life. Romans. The fiends, the Romans probably. So they dig a big hole, they throw the crosses in it. And then the Lord's friends found me there. Who are the Lord's friends? The apostles? Uh, no, because they're all dead by this time. This is, I think there's a footnote there. St. Helena. St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, who in 315, makes Christianity a legal religion. Well, Helena, around 314 or so, according to the tradition of the church, she had a vision that told her to go to Jerusalem and find the cross of Christ. 
it had been missing since the crucifixion. Okay? Constantine, by the way, was British, in case you didn't know that. <clears throat> so she goes to Jerusalem with some followers. She talks to the patriarch of Jerusalem. He's like, I don't know where it is. Oh, I've got some idea. I mean, people have said X, Y, Z. And she goes and she digs in various areas where people digging for her. I doubt that she did it herself. And they find this pit, and there are in this pit three crosses. Well, how do you know which one is which? The gospel accounts don't say Jesus's was bigger or shinier or had on it, you know, here is Jesus. It did apparently, according to the gospels, have a sign saying, here's King, you know, crucified King of the Jews. So the patriarch of Jerusalem said, I don't know how we'll figure out which one is which. We'll hold it up, and as in the account of the apostles in the book of Acts, Peter fall, walk, uh, people come under Peter's shadow and are healed. Or like the woman with the issue of blood comes and touches the hem of Christ's garment and is healed. He says, we'll do the same thing. We'll bring sick people, we'll bring crippled people, and we'll hold the cross up, and if they fall under the shadow, and the shadow makes them well, that's the cross of Christ. And so they do it with the other two crosses, and it doesn't do any good. And they bring up the third one, and they bring the lame under, and they can suddenly walk fine. They bring the deaf, the dumb, the blind, and they're no longer deaf, dumb, and blind. That's the cross of Christ. That event is celebrated every year twice. Once, 914, on what's called the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross, and the other time is the in the Eastern Church at least the third or the Orthodox Church the third week of Lent and it's called the glorious exaltation of the cross so there are two Sundays in the church calendar where the cross is celebrated now keep that in mind with the poem so up until this point, what has the cross been talking about? The battle. What kind of battle? When? History. The past. Everything up until this point has been the past from when the cross has been speaking. Now look what the cross says. Line 78. New. Thu might Yahiran. Now you might hear, my dear hero. Who's the my dear hero? The dreamer. So we've gone from the past to the present. Now I want you to hear, my dear hero, that I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrow. Emphasizing the time shift again. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me. Who's the they? The men over earth and all this glorious creation and pray to this sign. Those who pray to this sign. Both those on earth and all this glorious creation. On me, the Son of God suffered for a time. And so glorious now, I rise up under the heavens. And I'm able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. Notice, if you're not in awe of me, I can't do anything for you. What's the cross saying? What is required? Belief. Belief. Okay? Once, back then, I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers or humans. Lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he has also, so I was selected of all the trees of the forest, just as also he who, almighty God, we, we still see that juxtaposition, 
honored his mother, marry yourself above all womankind for the sake of all men. What theological box has the poet just ticked? Like, okay, I'm going to write this poem, and i got to make sure I have all my little theological ducks in order. Which one has he just ticked off to make sure I got it right? Uh, I need to acknowledge the BVM, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yep, took care of Mary. Now, I bid you, my beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men. Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. He wants the, spe he wants the dreamer to now do what? Go tell everyone. Tell everyone, one, about this dream, but more importantly, tell everyone what? About the cross. Why? Because it's the cross that saves you, it's the event the cross commemorates, or the event that occurred on the cross. How Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. What are Adam's ancient deeds? The bite of the apple. Well, we don't even know if it's an apple. It just says a fruit. It's a fruit. Okay. In the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church doesn't refer to Adam's sin as original sin. That language comes from the Western Church, largely from St. Augustine. Okay. The, the Orthodox Church refers to it as the exact same word that's used here. The ancestral sin. Okay? He says, for Adam's ancient deeds, his ancestral deeds, that is setting off the first one in the ancestors. Death he tasted there. In the Old English, One oh one. I know we're running out of time. Death he their birida. Yeah, this doesn't have the gloss. Um, the he there isn't capitalized in the manuscript. Right here. Death he their tasted. Who's the he? This is another critical question. That is a question that critics ask. Is he Christ? Notice, the user capitalizes it. You tend to capitalize when you're making it a divine person. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. Or is the he Adam? Adam tasted death. How do you know? When you do this, then thou shalt die. All right. But the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. He ascended into heaven. That's definitely Christ. He will come again. So what happened? Christ died. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He will come again. You're starting to get the language of, if you're familiar with it, the Nicene Creed. This is the, what's called the symbol of faith of the church. What all Christians in this time period would have accepted. Okay? So we've had he died on the cross. He rose again. He was born of Mary. He was the son of God. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday, almighty God, the Lord himself and all, all his angels with him. And he will judge. Why? Because he has the power of judgment. Each one according to as they have earned beforehand in this, and there's that word again, lana myth, in this loaned life, in this transitory life. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death, as he did earlier on that tree. That is, he's going to ask, each one comes up, did you bury your cross? Christ says, bury your cross and follow me. Did you do that? Okay. Then I, the dreamer, excuse me, the cross stops speaking. So we start with the dreamer. 
He has a dream. In the dream, the cross speaks to him. Now the cross is stopped. In that last part, the now I bid you, my beloved hero, what is the cross doing? What does bid mean? I command. I charge. I'm telling you, go do this. Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart, eagerly there where I was alone with little company. All alone. No company. It's like the teeth again. As far as we know, this guy could be the wanderer or the seafarer. Okay? You often have in Anglo-Saxon this image of a last survivor for some reason. And in fact, you not only have it in Old English, you have it running all throughout English literature. How many of you have read Sam, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the English Mariner? He's the last one living. How many of you read that god-awful book by Herman Melville, Moby Dick? <laughs> I've got a PhD. I've never finished a blasted book. Why? You get to that big, long section about whales. And <laughs> How's it begin? Call me Ishmael. Who is Ishmael within the book? The last survivor. The last survivor. Okay. And what does the speaker say? He goes on and says, I now look to the tree, the cross, it is my life's hope that I may ever seek the tree of glory and I will honor it and I wish that all men will find this, etc. I have few wealthy friends, Lytotes. He has none. Okay. And he even ticks off the box in the Nicene Creed about Christ descending into Hades what is called the harrowing of hell. For what purpose? To bring back all out of hell all those who look forward to his coming. Okay? Beginning with Adam and Eve. There is a medieval commonplace idea, and we'll stop with this, that from Adam and Eve's death, they were in hell, but don't think of hell as the modern conception fire and flames. It's Sheol. It's the place of death. And why? They were awaiting the coming of their Redeemer. Okay? And some fathers of the medieval church said, guess what? Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, they were awaiting it too. Because when Christ went and destroyed hell and destroyed the gates of hell, what did he do? If that door is the door that locked people into hell, he came up and obliterated. So the door is no longer there. So those who are in hell are those who want to be in hell. Everybody else was, come on, follow me. And if they recognize Christ, they followed him. Okay, we'll stop there. To Thursday starts... I'm sure what some of you will think of as